students, as you know, uh, we have uh, we have to have one lecture every week to commemorate uh, the Azadi Cabinet Mahotsav. The every government department uh, is doing some or other activity, and uh, ICR also has taken up many activities. And this is just a part of uh, that important activity. And uh, till date, we have organized uh, 51 lectures. Uh, today is the 52nd lecture. So again, it's a matter of, and we are, as for the schedule, uh, in conducting these lectures. Uh, this lecture is attended by senior officers from ICR. This is attended by the vice chancellors of the ICR in, of the uh, state agricultural universities, the senior faculty, uh, the senior scientists, directors of ICR institutes, and uh, the other uh, persons uh, we allow just uh, on some other platforms, uh, the live streaming and uh, the, the other customized platforms which we have uh, created for this particular purpose. Uh, friends, as you know, uh, today's lecture is uh, given uh, by a very important uh, person, a very good uh, researcher, eminent researcher, and uh, that is uh, none other than our uh, secretary, Department of Science and Technology. Um, <coughs> Dr. Chansekar, Dr. S. Chansekar. Uh, uh, I want to again thank you, sir, for uh, accepting this invitation to deliver on this important platform. And I want to just, for the benefit of the audience, uh, I want to just uh, tell them the brief about uh, Dr. Chansekar, who is going to speak on a very important topic, and that is the saga of science. And there cannot be any better person than Dr. Chansekar to deliver this important talk where he is going to talk uh, about what has been the contribution of the science uh, in various fields. Like we all have seen uh, how the science contributed in coming out in a very limited time for these uh, vaccines, uh, which are totally uh, indigenous. And then uh, you, you can see uh, how we have come uh, with this green revolution, blue revolution, the white revolution, many, many other things uh, you can see. That is just because of the science and about which uh, uh, Professor Chansekar is going to speak. Friends, uh, Professor Chansekar uh, is uh, the bachelor's, master's and PhD degree from Usmania University. Uh, while the work for PhD was carried out in the IICT uh, on total uh, synthesis of the uh, cyclosporin. Uh, if I start talking about uh, uh, Dr. Chansekar, I think there is not any award which has not been received by him. There are so many awards. Uh, I'll just tell only a few of them. But before that, I would just want to tell uh, all the uh, audience, I mean, an audience, that he's a great researcher also. Uh, he has guided 80 students who have obtained their PhD uh, degree. And uh, 20 students are currently pursuing their research work with Dr. Chansey. He has 300 publications and 22 patents with over 7,000 citations, a proud moment for any uh, researcher. Dr. Uh, Sivari Chansegar has made significant contributions in the diverse areas of organic chemistry, especially in chiral chemistry, and uh, total synthesis of biologically active natural products. The development of PET PEG as a novel solvent medium created a totally different platform for practitioners of green chemistry. Uh, friends, uh, he was awarded uh, A.V. Uh, Zamar Rao Chair in 2020, and his team was awarded CSIR Technology Award during 2021 for the process for vaccine adjuvant in Covaxin 2020. He received the Golden Jubilee Commemoration of Medal. He has been honored by Chemical Research Society of uh, India for uh, his extensive and outstanding contributions to research in chemistry and he has been selected for the AstraZeneca Research Endowment Award for the year 2019. There are a series of awards. Uh, I think we are all proud of uh, Dr. Chansekar to have such a uh, wonderful uh, contribution in the field of science, and he's a motivation for our young scientists. So uh, we are thankful to you, sir, uh, for uh, uh, accepting our inv invitation. And uh, we are sure uh, that uh, with your, uh, uh, this lecture, uh, we will be greatly benefited, and uh, we are eagerly looking for your lecture, sir. Uh, and I request uh, Dr. T. Mahapatra, our uh, secretary and uh, DGICR, to kindly chair this session. 
So uh, with the permission of the speaker and the chair, uh, I invite uh, Dr. Chansegar to kindly take the floor and uh, deliver the talk. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mahabhadra ji. Uh, thanks, Agarwal ji, for the very elaborate in, uh, introduction. Thanks, Mahabhadra ji, for the invitation. While uh, uh, I'll take the next 40 minutes, hopefully I have about 40, 45 minutes. No, 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 yeah, yeah. Time. no. Uh, so next 40 minutes, I'll try to uh, take you to a journey of science. While I will not touch upon the India's independence and the science lectures, which we have been hearing for some time now, I just thought that deviate from the talks, what we have been doing for the last some time, uh, to see whether my friends uh, who are on the call, uh, who are mostly experts on agricultural sciences and made India truly Atmanirbhar on the food security, whether I will be able to convey some message on the health sector a little bit while touching upon the agriculture sector, which I'm sure for all of you, what I speak is going to be some textbook content, but also try to touch upon uh, the future of energy sector. So while I'm talking of energy sector and security of energy, we are all now realizing that energy plays an important role for all sectors. It is just not agriculture. It's not just health. It is not just transportation. It is not just construction, but energy plays a major role in all sectors. And maybe the cost of any product is driven by the cost of the energy. Even today, we look at if there is an increase in price of energy sector, naturally, all other sectors' prices will go up. So we also would like to look at how the energy sector is likely to evolve and what is that we as scientific fraternity do. And when we talk of hydrogen, we always talk of bioenergy. And we know agriculture sector could play a very important role on how we can bring in bioenergy into the forefront. So I'll run through the slides, but as I run the slides, hopefully a small story is built and then hopefully we'll have some, some points to ponder around. So I'm trying to just share my screen and hopefully it's yes, visible. We can see, we can see sir. Yeah. So I just took the saga of science, added a little prefix, 13th to 21st century. Because when we look at uh, the science which has been documented uh, in the modern era, after we came, we have a paper to write or a book to print. So I thought in the last 400, 500 years, how science has evolved and how we have been following it up. So entire of my talk revolves around these two books. And uh, this talk actually I've given uh, with context to uh, some young kids around, but then I just take you around agriculture sector a little more and health a little more and more technical parts. So these are the two books I got fascinated reading. One is, of course, Science and History, which really makes a statement. If you are looking for a book that captures the personal drama and achievement of science, then look no further. I mean, that's the kind of comment uh, Guardian has given. Similarly, if you look at uh, the uh, Yuval Nova Harari's 21 lessons for the 21st century, those who really don't read, uh, have no habit of reading these general books, I strongly suggest each uh, chapter gives you a lesson, starting from agriculture to food, to evolution of processes, to energy. So it's a book which I think uh, we could read. While it's a little serious book, but certainly a, a read uh, for all of us. So I just want to convey a sentiment to some young colleagues, also who are on the call, hopefully on our YouTube uh, channels and other means. Science has to be driven by a personal passion. We cannot say that I'll give you a grant, you do some science. I think that science will never reach the masses. I think science has to be driven by the individual. And individual also needs to choose the problems which are relevant to society. Many a times, uh, most of us choose problems which are basically uh, more pronounced in the literature. For example, something is happening up in journals like Nature or Science or we catch hold of some buzzwords of United Nations and start picking those words and trying to reorient our own research groups into those sectors. I think every country should have their own science priorities. Many a time we are gone with the wind. So I just would like to convey that whether we all as agriculture or science and technology or health or energy sectors, I think can we really look at the problems which are of 
personal nature to our country because we are investing taxpayers' funds in those activities. So just to capture, never stop learning, assume nothing, teach others what you know. Many a times it's nice that we tell others what we are doing. Many a times we feel shy from telling, oh, what I'm doing is too small. The guy with whom I'm talking is too big a guy. He may not appreciate my work. He may make fun of me. So we tend not to tell what we know. I think that inhibition maybe we need to get out. And problems have to be analyzed objectively. So these are some traits which scientists has. I think scientists would be lauded. Many a time scientists are criticized that they are egoistic. They may not take up the challenges what society needs. I think these are some traits which all scientists uh, could have. So I have divided our whole sciences when we talk of agricultural sciences or physical sciences or biological sciences, earth sciences. We have only made our own boundaries, actually. So when I talk of agricultural science, I don't think agricultural science would have achieved what it has achieved through the Green Revolution, what we are all proud of, unless the pesticide industry of chemical sector has done well, or urea was made affordable, or the genetic scientists really work to make sure that the genetic varieties are available. So I think now the sciences have no boundaries, but we as human beings for our own convenience and comfort, we have created these boundaries, but hopefully someday science is one, it is not uh, so many branches. So as I told, science has to be our own passion. And if you look at the traditional science, traditional is not the traditional knowledge we have, but the evolution of science, as I told in 13th century, 14th century, I don't think there were agencies like ICAR or DST or ICMR or D DBT or any other NIH funding agencies that a scientist could go and write a proposal and get some grant and do research. Those scientists in the areas of 1500, 1400, 1600 time, either they would use their own personal money to do whatever science they would like to do. That means they had a passion. So they were able to spend their personal money to get their thoughts clarified, whether my thought in science is correct or not correct. Or they would go to local kingdoms, present their work to the king, and if King is impressed that this is something really interesting, they would get some grant. And they also had no journals. Today, we are competing on impact factor 0 0.5 to 100, depending on the area in which you work. But scientists, science can be published any impact journal. It need not be in the journal impact factor 100, or it could be zero. But what is the impact that science is making? I think that's the impact factor. It is not the mathematical formula we all calculate the number of papers published by that particular journal, how many times that journal has got citations in the preceding year, you say X minus Y by 100 into 8 by 2 by 4 by 100, some big um, formula you create and say this journal is better than this journal. I think slowly it's the leadership. We need to really think differently whether science is making impact, not the impact factor of the journal decides fate of some of, some of us. So these examples on the slide shows you how these scientists use their personal wealth or with their passion, they have driven the science. If you look at Aristotle, could be considered as the first scientist of the modern era. Or maybe we could say Grosset, who 1175, 1253, is believed to be the founder of the modern experimental scientist. So these are some of the poster boys. Poster boys need not be in film industry or cricket industry or political industry or political science or politics or science. But I think these are the people who have made science proud. They are the people who change the way we are living today. If we can't even imagine an airport security today without the discovery of X-rays, for example. But while discovering X-rays, the sacrifice made by Mary Curie working on radioactive elements and sacrificing her own life. Or if you look at India as a truly self-sufficient defense sector, we can't even forget the contributions made by Abdul Kalam. Or the kind of genetics we have done with Batson Creek models. So these are the poster boys for all of us. And these scientists are going to be eternal. Eternal is not that you donate some funds and you make a temple or you make a school or you make a college. You will be eternal. Your name is printed on a small wall and then the temple or that school is gone and your name is gone. But... As long as humanity is there, these people are going to be there and their names will be remembered forever. So this is time during this Azadi Ka Amrit Mahonsav that we remember those scientists, not only those who have contributed from across the world, but scientists who have made important pioneering roles 
as I told Asima Chatterjee, Professor CNR Rao. If you go back to PC Ray, Jagdish Chandra Bose, C.V. Raman. So we can really name people who have really transformed our, our country and the planet the way we are living on this planet. So just to begin, science has begun with the observation of the environment what we are living in. For example, a physics or an ast uh, astronomy scientist may not require any tools. Maybe I need a big uh, round bottom flask or I need a magnetic cellar or I need some chemicals to do science. So I cannot really do science without having a laboratory. But imagine for someone entire universe is the laboratory for him or her. So for him or her, just go out of the nature, look at the sky, look at the stars, and then start imagining, get a small telescope, look at the supernovas. And that's how entire physics and astronomy has begun. And these are the heroes we can really uh, remember today. The first scientific observations of the sky, stars, planet, comets, supernova. So Copernicus, Bruno, Tycho Brahe. So these are people we could really remember. Even Indian astronomical contributions are phenomenal. Then we look at the how we made the clock, the Indian clock or the Hindu clock, and how the astronomy has played an important role in all these things. So I think these are the things we need to remember as part of the 75 years. But if you look at these principles of Kepler laws, or if you look at Galileo's telescope, so these tools have given a larger perspective of both physics and astronomy to a large extent. If you look at Galileo, can be considered father of the observational astronomy. He has built telescopes. Then he championed the heliocentric universes versus the controversial. Then had to face inquest because he was championing the heliocentric universe. He was also under the house arrest because he said what is happening geocentric is wrong. So sometimes scientists have to be loud. If something is wrong, it is wrong. So this courage scientists should have. This is a message we could get from his own life. Then telescopes and lenses really were the tools developed to make this science branch a very large one. If you look at biology, again, all of us are the beneficiaries of biology, whether you're an agricultural scientist or a chemist or a health sector. I think we're all beneficiaries of this science. If you look at Robert Hooke, who was born in 1635, and he was not expected to survive because of some genetic disorders he was born with. He had no digestive system that he can digest the solid meal. So he was taking milk, milk products, fruits, but he survived and he went on to make most famous discoveries, cellular structure of slices of pork, microorganisms in droplets of water, sperm cells, structure of feathers, nature of butterfly wings, then compound eye of a fly. So these are the contributions which again transformed the modern biology to be what we are conceiving today. So if you look at the health sector, personally, I've been engaged in my research into these activities. We all have looked at Shashruta, the contributions of Shashruta. So the moment we get the word surgery, we get the name of Shashruta, who was able to do microsurgeries in the eye, ear. We can't even imagine when robots were not there, microsurgicals were not there, nanosciences is a word which doesn't exist. He was able to do those microsurgeries using the tools he has made himself. If you look at this nice article which Yogi Ashwini has written some time ago, Sushruta would sit by the shore of the Ganges at night and wait for corpse to flow, corpus to flow downstream. He would pick them and practice surgeries on that. Can any of us today's generation would imagine that someone like him was waiting for a dead body to float in the Ganges, take it out, take home, practice surgery so that he can practice them on the living human beings and then make surgery an important tool which became life-saving for all of us. So there's a message again that courage in science is very, very critical. So if you look at my own chemistry, which I practice the chemical sciences, organic and organic physical, we all depend on heat of elements, metallurgy, petroleum chemicals. All this is because I know that temperature can be measured till then. We were not able to sign, do proper documentation of science because to measure a temperature, you need a thermometer. And we didn't have a thermometer to measure, except we know that water boils at certain temperature. But till we know that water boils 100 degrees centigrade, for example, or human body temperature is 98.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Till these tools were available, chemistry could not be documented. 
nor could be reproduced properly in the documents. So this is something, again, I think we are proud of that these innovations have helped us. But just to tell a cartoon story for young colleagues, if you're watching on this call, for us, how do you discover something which is not seen? Today, we have been fighting with an enemy which we cannot see with the naked eye. Even one of the finest microscopes cannot see the coronavirus, but you need really an electron microscope with proper resolution to really look at the, the crown protein and whatnot we have been talking for the last two years. But imagine a scientist could know that there are some gases around us and one of gases is our life saving. If that gas is not there, we will not survive. And how do you call it oxygen? Here is an experiment he has done. He has taken a couple of mice, take a belly jar, keep the mice under it and then waiting for it. And he found that this mice died after a certain time. And then based on the time it survived, how many gases are there? Then he tried to produce pure oxygen by burning a chemical called mercury oxide. Again, he filled the bell jar. Now he put the same animals. It lived three times more. Okay, if I produce pure gas out of mercury heating, animal lives three times longer. If I take natural air, it lives only one third. Okay, and that means oxygen is only one third. The living air, living gas, which is available in this planet is only one third. So very crude experiment, but today no one can dispute the experiment the way it has been performed. As I told X-rays, we always remember talking from airport security. If we have a small fracture accident to look at the bone injury, I think X-rays play an important role. Security at the airport. I mean, these are all the discoveries happened because sacrifices made by some scientists. Just to get into our today, we are worried about the infection, corona infection, viral infection. But before virus was even known to us, we were also dying of bacterial infection. Have you ever thought that in world humanity was dying because of infections which could be cured today with a penicillin injection or a penicillin tablet, which we call cephalosporins or kind of antibiotics we are, we are getting. But people were dying for want of these antibiotics in the early 1920s, 1930s, 1940s. So this again shows how people have taken courage of discovering the new drugs to give our life expectancy longer. Just I would like to read one sentence on this slide. Paul Elrich, Nobel Prize in 1908, he proposed certain dyes could selectively stain bacterial cells. That means these chemicals are binding to the bacterial cell wall and it's getting color. He says, okay, that means the cell is now neutralized. Now, can I use this dye as an antibiotic? And he took a chemical called proton cell, the first azo dye drug to treat streptococci infection invented by Bayer Laboratory. Then imagine another scientist who got a Nobel Prize in 1939, Dumas, administered this drug to his daughter who had streptococcal infection. Today we are worried after phase three trial of a molecule, we are real still worried whether is Bharat vaccine done properly, whether AstraZeneca is better or this is better or that is better. So we debate, but here is a scientist who took a path of clinical trial on his daughter, not knowing the properties of the chemical. And it cured her, but she became colored because it was dye color. But of course, that color disappeared after the dye is gone. But this is how he was able to discover sulfamethoxazole, which has saved millions of lives on this, on this planet. We all heard of vaccine for the last one and a half years. Now we're talking of the third dose. If you look at the evolutionary process of how vaccines are discovered, you can imagine smallpox vaccine were discovered by Edward Jenner in 1790. 96, and the BCG vaccine was discovered in 1924, tetanus was in 1927, diphtheria vaccine in 1930, polio, we can look today, we are all so happy that we are living normal life, polio vaccine was discovered in 55, otherwise you would have seen so many people suffering from polio. Then polio oral has come, then measles vaccine, hepatitis, COVID-19 vaccine. So this is how the entire evolutionary process and if you look at 1900 onwards, after the vaccination by WHO, UN, the government of India, all this today, we are able to see the average expectancy of all of us has gone up. Otherwise, we had so many child deaths. Naturally, when there are child deaths, automatically the average age would come down. So we look at by 2031, prediction is that we will have so many therapies that we will know what disease we will get in the next few months or in a few years. And then you can take a treatment even before it comes. So cure would play very, I mean, prevention will play a very, very important role as our time progresses. 
And if you look at uh, the contributions of general who isolated a smallpox pus and inject into eight year old boy, which made smallpox disappear. Okay, that's how the smallpox vaccine was discovered. Even smallpox vaccine when developed by Jenner after observation that people who had a cowpox did not get the smallpox. So he went on to see that if those who get a cowpox working in the cows fields and all, they would not get the smallpox. So this is how the area of uh, vaccines has developed. So just this cartoon tells you when you look at Paleolithic time till 2020 and further, we see the average age expectancy has gone from 31, 32 years. It dropped down to 28, 29 around the bronze iron age. Again, went back to 30 in 1900s and went up to 80 and it is going up and up. Today, we see in France, people live 90 years. In Japan, people live 90 years. India, we live 70 years. Who knows a day will come, we all live 120 years. The oldest confirmed recorded age is 120. And Hindus believe that 120 years is the lifespan of humans. That's why we celebrate at the 60th year, which is the milestone, 50, halfway down, we all celebrate Shashti Purti, 60 years of our life. So who knows, we all live for 120 years, but whether the resources, what we have, what ICR is doing, what agricultural researchers are doing, are we going to feed if we're all living for 120 years and world population reaches 10 billion and 11 billion and 12 billion, we don't know what all it increases. We all know that the land size is decreasing, water resources are depleting, but then how are we going to feed all of them? So these challenges we as scientists, I think, should start thinking of. While we are talking of 2047, what is that we would like to do? I'm sure Professor Mahapatra has been part of all these deliberations. So India in 100th year of independence, what is that we want to do? While we do good science, we are able to do revolutions, what uh, we have been talking of green, blue, orange, whatever revolution we have done. But if you look at all of us, all this we do so that we are all happy. And we live happily for longer life without any health problems. So if you look at the happiest countries in the world, why are they happy? Why some countries are not happy? So if you look at the parameters of happiness, GDP per capita plays an important role. So what is that we should do that will increase the per capita of the country? Again, all of us as scientists, we have committed that the farmer's income would be doubled. So what is that we all as researchers do? Healthy years of life expectancy. We don't want to live after 60 in a hospital bed, suffering from cancer, or Alzheimer's, Parkinson. I think we want to live healthy till 120. Of course, social support has to be around. Then trust, freedom to make life decisions. These are all the parameters which are used by these agencies to give those happiest country indexes. So let us work around these areas. What is that we as researchers uh, could contribute? So for planet to be happy, while we, are, we want to be happy, but planet also has to be happy. You have seen planet is getting warmer, angry. So how can we make planet cool and happy? So if we are all healthy, agriculture is taken care properly, and we provide proper energy security, I think the planet will be happy with proper checks and balances. So good health is one theme we all work. I will not bore you with my sector, but just to tell you those who are not in pharma sector, those who studied college chemistry, I just want to tell you how small a molecule on the screen is looking for you. Paracetamol, we all know that uh, when COVID was there, we all got a household name Dolo. 650 milligram paracetamol is sold as a brand Dolo. Then aspirin, which is used for pain. Very simple structure. You all look at it, just a benzene ring, having a carboxyl group, acyl group, nitrogen. Very simple. Easiest to make on this planet. If any chemist can make easy, these are the two molecules. But now, is India Atmanirbhar in these two drugs? Not really. So what is that we need to do? How can I make my country Atmanirbhar? We get 70% raw materials from somewhere. We do some tweaking and make the drug here. But can we really start from benzene, which is available from the petroleum sector, and use benzene as a raw material and make a drug out of it? Instead of China takes benzene, make it phenol, and you buy phenol from China and make a product out of it. So these are the challenges I think we need to post to our chemistry friends. Similarly, if you look at the nature, and India having one of the largest coasts for any country can have, if you look at many, many marine sources, many sponges, corals, give 
lot of very value added products and we miss them for example so if you look at uh, the sirolimus rapamycin it's immunosuppressant used for organ transplant and uh, it also can cure cancer it also is a age enhancer average life of any animal you have tested so far if you take rapamycin the age increases so how can we make this affordable to our planet a very important story i want to share with all our friends history of rapamycin very interesting to understand it was isolated from a soil bacterium streptomyces i'm sorry i made a statement marine it is a streptomyces but marine gives a lot of drugs which i show next slide so if you look at this streptomyces hygroscopicus from easter island but it was named as rapamycin because it came from an easter island called rapunui sample with a industry in montreal called ayers laboratories but this company got bankrupt very interestingly one of our indian colleagues dr suren segal an employee of this company the company told that we are closing this company now so we are all laid off but our samples we cannot keep in the refrigerator now so kindly destroy them shut down the factory and then we are all going you know but suren segal did not destroy the sample he had a trust that this chemical is going to be a game changer so against the dictat of the company against the supervisor's dictat he took this company chemical went to a company called vyat pharma then went on to other companies and finally it became a drug and today this is used as a preferred drug in oncology in organ transplant and clinical trials for age expectancy increase had he thrown this sample we would have never got this molecule sometimes it's also important to look for everything and anything rather than ignoring anything so just to take care of healthcare as i told i would like to tell my agricultural friends who are watching this call diseases are common to the planet maybe some diseases are common to countries driven by poverty some diseases are to affluent countries like obesity we eat more food less exercise obesity cardiovascular blood pressure cns so poverty driven countries we may have respiratory infections air quality poor tuberculosis so neglected diseases childhood so either way these diseases are killing the humanity and human lives so how can we make molecules so malaria is something we are all familiar with india is still has a challenge on malaria so these are the four molecules which treat malaria interestingly compound number 4 which is also grown in the himalayan belt or tether this can be given for diseases where the original drugs like chloroquine and mefloquine don't work rt ether can work but if rt ether doesn't work then what is that we do but just to look at again rt ether story a chinese scientist she got nobel prize in medicine many times those who look at nobel prizes we look at chemistry nobel prize goes to scientists working in the health sector but here is a case where a chemist getting nobel prize in the medicinal medical fraternity so she was able to study all the plants again all the medicinal plants which have medicinal properties and she was screening all of them she gathered about 640 prescriptions and then she was working so hard i think the last statement is always touchy to me any time i read that statement her daughter was sent to boarding school and could not meet her till to accomplished her task that means she went to lab and never came back till the task was accomplished did not meet her daughter also and today she got nobel prize today this plant which is grown in himalayan belt also on the chinese side saves millions of lives similarly a marine natural product i spoke to you this comes from tropical marine sponges and this can cure malaria so my personal group work on on these molecules similarly we are talking of we want to live for 100 years 120 years but we are not understanding as our life expectancy goes beyond 75 80 the chances of the brain cells memory cells dying alzheimer's parkinson will trigger so what are the drugs which can cure alzheimer and parkinson so this is here a molecule from an alkaloid again this can cure alzheimer parkinson and then india needs to work on those things i'll rush through on these slides because i told you i'll take 40 minutes i'm almost 35 minutes already so similarly tuberculosis if you look at tuberculosis a small bacterium 0.2 micrometers in length but today one third of the world population or one fourth i'm sorry 40% 35% of the world population are infected with mycobacterium and who knows this could be the next pandemic we are worried about corona is going hopefully is gone but who knows tb could be next pandemic honorable prime minister has already given a clarion call 
India would be tuberculosis free by 2030. So what is that we should do? Whether it is nutritional food, which you can play an important role, because malnutrition plays an important role in tuberculosis. Whether drugs could be discovered, or whether we will have clean air, what is that we need to do? We'll have a vaccine for tuberculosis. So these are the challenges we all work. Again, my personal research group work on all these areas of research. I'll just show you a review published some time ago. And the next drug on tuberculosis we, we made very quickly on COVID to share with my friends. Those families, if they have suffered from COVID, if they were given uh, fav favipiravir, which is flu, which was given to patients or remdesivir injection, these were technologies were made in ICT. even a director here. My personal research group worked on using the local chemicals to make these drugs available to our population. So future healthcare look good, but we need to work more and see how we can make better, better healthcare products affordable. So while we talk of health, I would like to touch upon the agriculture, which is your core area. But while you are making the green revolution and we were giving the pesticide from chemical sector, this again disturbs all of us, the cancer train. So Punjab area of cultivation is 1.5% of India, but we produce 19% of the India's requirement and 12% of the rice production. And I'm sure all of you have read this, the Malwa region of Punjab, the laboratory for green revolution. But then the fertilizer use, the overabuse of chemicals. So we need to run special trains for cancer patients from Bikaniri in Rajasthan, Batinda in Punjab to Bikaniri in Rajasthan carrying the cancer patients. So then what is that we as researchers have done? On one side, we are proud that we were able to solve the problem of famine, availability of accessible food, affordability, but in the process, we also made some mistakes. So how do we correct this now? And that correction could happen with the intervention of all of you as agricultural scientists and other researchers on how we can solve this problem. Again, this is a very classical slide I shared with my friends, how agriculture has evolved, we were hunters and became gatherers. During the Mesopotamia period, we recorded the first beginning of the agriculture. Then how domestication of animals, taking a small land, allowing to grow using cow dung as an organic farming, how we made urea. I mean, this is all how the evolutionary process has happened. But we look to go back and see what are the small mistakes if we have done. Can we correct those mistakes? And these revolutions, as uh, all of you would have read, starting from Neolithic, British Green, Arab Scottish revolutions, the plant species, all that. I think these are the revolutionary things which made world today almost sufficient to have enough food for all of us. While we still see some African countries have poverty, but we have done it. Similarly, the breeding has allowed us to see the animal size increasing, the meat production has increased, your corn size has gone from Theocyne, intermediate size to modern corn, but whether the nutritional values retained or any micronutrients have gone reduction in the process of this evolutionary process of enhancing the crop, need to really relook at with the new tools currently what we have. I will not bore you with your green revolution of what all uh, your science has done, which we are all proud of. But then I would like to just throw some challenges. What is that green evolution, what we have done? And what is that we will do now? What are the pests we want to stop? Do we really get new pesticides which are harmless to the farmers? What is the kind of now that the new Indian law which allows us gene editing as a tool? I had the privilege of meeting some colleagues from ICRISAT uh, last week. So what is that ICAR, ICRISAT, world researchers using CRISPR technologies? Where are we going to take these new technologies for our next step? So this compact slide will say entire integrated farming for all of us, farm planning, budgeting, animal production, aquaculture, crop protection, vegetables, traditional crops, then hybridizing the crops or rotating the crops. I'm sure all that is done, but how do we really scale up and more scientific ways of handling it? So new trends, I'm sure you're all propagating. So we are proud of you again using drones. I will be happy to share with you that DST has the largest programs today running on drones. Entire Abadi, the Panchayat Raj Ministry, works with us on mapping the entire Indian landscape, 
water bodies, houses, farming land, non-cultivatable land. I think this is where I think ICR, DST works very closely to see that the drone technologies are used for advantage. Just on the lighter sense, ISCT worked aggressively on pheromones. This is yet another area which has really not reached every farmer. If ICR believes that this integrated pest management using pheromone technology should be scaled up, propagated, I think ISCT is an institute where I think we could work closely. Again, if you look at uh, this slide, I'm sure Mahapatraji has shown this slide recently when he was giving a talk to all of us in ISCT auditorium. The production, who produces more? What value of production, percentage share? How India could really become a world leader in this sector, I think, is to be talked. If India has cultivated area 191 hectares and China has lesser hectares, but whether why China is producing more crop than us. So some challenges we need to ask ourselves. China uses 14 billion retail level of pesticides. India uses only 3 billion. But why then India has challenges? Whether the quality of pesticide is not good. Again, fertilizers, we use only 27. They use 58. So there are some challenges which I think we need to work with agricultural sector, industrial sector, chemical sector. What is that? Uh, we could really take it forward. I would skip this slide, how meat was produced in the lab, now DBT fund programs. So vegetarian can eat meat if you cultivate meat in the laboratory. But then these two sectors, health and agriculture, to have a safe planet, energy plays a very important role. In the next four slides, I'll quickly run through to tell you how the energy sector has evolved. For us, in the first energy for this planet come from another planet, sun. So we were able to tap the first fire from sun or by taking two stones and rubbing and getting a fire. And we also studied in the history that during the rock era, whatever little fire was generated, they used to preserve that fire in small caves so that whenever you want a fire, you bring it out and they keep burning that. We went start from burning wood to candle to uh, no kerosene, diesel, petrol. Now what not solar light. Now we are talking of hydrogen energy. So how the energy evolution has happened as I told, fire discovery from 400,000 BC. Till today, we are able to do that. But then we are already worried that in the next 30 years, 50 years, all our fossil fuels, such as petrol, diesel, coal, may disappear. Forest growth may not be there because we need more and more cultivatable lands, more of urbanization. So we may not have wood to burn. Then what do you do? Will you take solar energy? When you're talking of solar energy, already we are worried that the solar panels, which are put on the roof 30 years ago, 20 years ago, how are you going to recycle them? Where are you going to dump all these rooftops? Now, how will you recover the metal which is built in those solar panels? So on a paper, it looked like water could be the most ideal fuel for anything. Can water be split into hydrogen and oxygen? So oxygen will come to all of us. Hydrogen will go to your car or your agricultural sector, tractor running and all that. So from wind, biomass, hydro, solar, geothermal, tidal, hydrogen. Hydrogen could be considered the future fuel. We have recently seen Honorable Minister Nitin Gadkari came in a hydrogen car to the parliament to show what is future for all of us. So lesson to learn. Do you want to produce hydrogen from water? Do you want to produce hydrogen from bio waste? or agricultural waste, biomass. So challenges continue to challenge us. And then we need to take those problems while doing all that. Our gas emissions, greenhouse gas minimization. And as committed by Honorable Prime Minister of India to the world, that by 2070, India would be carbon neutral. Bhutan becomes the first carbon negative country in the world. Maybe the industrialization for them. But while feeding... 1.5 billion people helping the world, how India would become carbon neutral, if not negative. And these challenges have to be asked. Global warming, we know carbon dioxide concentration is now at 380 ppm and it increased to 450 ppm will result in temperature increase to 2 degrees. We already seen the heat waves in the first week of April, last week of March, only temperature soaring at 40, 41. So what is that we as collective researchers address these problems is going to be 
the future challenge and Indian researchers are geared up to take up these challenges. I'm sure all of us will mitigate these problems effectively. I would like to just leave a note. This slide is picked up from the book I told you from 21 lessons from the 21st century. The basic human needs provided to everyone free of charge will be taken for granted at some point of time. So we need to really focus on what are the non-basic luxuries. We may get a fancy self-driving car very soon. Even DST has funded driverless cars, access to virtual reality parks, enhanced bioengineered bodies. Gap between the rich and poor will increase as we increase the technology more. But how do we minimize the gap? Maybe machines will be designed to suit the temperament of the customer. This is very funny to make a statement. Because we all know that Tesla made the first self-driven car. He would start a car called Tesla Altruist. In emergency, it will sacrifice the owner, but help the greater good. But who will buy this car? If you say, you know, it is free, I say, I don't want to buy an altruist car because I want to live longer. Maybe Tesla Egoist will be the most expensive car because it will do everything it will do to save the owner at any cost. But do you really want this kind of egoistic car or you want a nice car altruist or still a, people like us drive the car who have senses? We don't depend on AI, but we depend on our consciousness. So future is great, but challenges are many and we all should work together towards that. I just try to touch upon in the last 40 minutes, 45 minutes maybe, to tell you how the science in the 1500s started on and how we got relativity evolution. I did not touch upon the contributions of Indian science. I'm sure a few other speakers in the last 50 conferences you attended, I'm sure one or two speakers must have touched upon. I thought I would not touch upon those things. History of science, we should know to understand essentials, to understand the processes, trends, so that we can plan our future better for the human well-being. I would like to stop here for giving this opportunity to... I sincerely thank all of you for giving this opportunity, talking to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Mohapat Raji, and uh, thank you all for, uh, for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sansegaji, for this wonderful talk and for recalling the contribution of scientists uh, for the well-being of the human. And uh, recently, we have seen uh, during this COVID period, as I told uh, in the initial remarks, and you have reminded us uh, of the great contributions, uh, how uh, and uh, how the great scientists uh, of India and uh, the, at the global level, uh, whether it's Aristotle, whether it's a uh, Copernicus, whether it's uh, any any scientist, uh, the first vaccine uh, and how this uh, this has been evolved, uh, this vaccine term. And one important message which I could uh, gather was that let us always not think that only the funding can uh, promote the uh, science. So th that has to be a passion uh, from uh, all of us. And generally people think because the fund is not there, I'm not able to do the research, I'm not able to do. So that passion should always uh, be there. Uh, there are many things I'm not going to uh, recall uh, and uh, repeat uh, all those things which we have just talked. But I just want to take a few questions, if you allow. And uh, one of our uh, audience is asking uh, Dr. N.T. Yaduraju uh, that what can be done to attract the youngsters uh, to science? Uh, can, can you just please? Yeah. Yaduraju, I think uh, attracting young talent is very important. Uh, you raise a very important concern. When the IT boom began in uh, 2000, we saw a lot of youth getting into engineering sciences, computer science. But science, as I told, has to be driven by passion. So what we need to do is we need to go and motivate youngsters, not only the young colleagues, but their parents also. The contribution science has made to the planet. And uh, if someone is joining army defense sector, for example, I don't think they join for money or they join for a fashion, but they have the commitment to serve the nation. So we need to bring that kind of a culture in our youth. And uh, that's what we could get the best youngsters. Otherwise, what will happen? Those who don't get any job elsewhere will come to science. So certainly all of us need to work towards that. Many programs currently we are doing uh, in the government of India with DST, the kind of fellowships we offer, 
Ramanujam Fellowship, Ramalingam Swami Fellowship, Inspire Schemes. I'm sure all this will enable. But more than that, as I told, we will go and build that passion amongst the youth. If I go and tell my young student that if science was not there, entire planet would have disappeared because Covaxin was not there or Covishield was not there. If we tell this word to youngsters, they will come to us. I think we need to really go and tell Thank them. you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, there is another question by Dr. Manish Das. Uh, there is a gap uh, between the scientific community and the general public. How do we close it? This is again very typical interview question when I faced uh, DGCS <laughs> and interview and DST secretary. This question is asked. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look at this question, end of the day, how if our science reaches masses. Again, COVID proved beyond doubt every common man was seeing DGICMR on the TV every day or AIMS director on the television. They have been more on the television show telling us rather than film stars and sports stars and all that. So when panic has come, we have shown our power. Now it's time we continue the momentum. Okay. So, but general public should not look at us that these scientists do what they like. I think we need to do what they want. Our science should reach the masses. Science should not reach a publication in Nature with 15.5 impact factor and you pay 5,000 pounds to publish our paper in Nature and then you get an award and reward. That's one way of looking at science. But is my science reaching the masses? I think we do introspection on a regular basis. If I take a two crore grant from government of India, this two crores, okay, it has trained two PhD students. Fine. Great. I'm happy. Now it also has given two publications. Great. But out of two, one publication, is it going to solve one problem this planet is going to face in the next 20 years? I think our question should be right when we start our research work. Then we will automatically get connected to public. Thank you. Thank you. Now I request uh, the chairman of uh, the session, uh, Dr. T. Mahapatra, I was a secretary there and DGICR uh, to give his uh, remarks, please. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for an excellent uh, uh, lecture uh, to us, to my colleagues. Uh, we have uh, with us really senior colleagues and vice chancellors of various universities uh, hooked to this program, and that's what happens. And we have uh, Professor R.B. Singh, who was a very senior. Uh, you know, uh, our guide uh, teacher with us and almost every lecture he is uh, attending. And, uh, you know, we have uh, also many youngsters, as you have been referring to, many youngsters also attending this. So for everybody, uh, it's a uh, exposure to uh, the uh, developments in science, uh, various fields, uh, how uh, many, many milestones were achieved and how uh, the modern science evolved uh, from uh, you know, those fundamentals uh, which were actually done uh, you know, several uh, you know, centuries ago, and how the modern society has actually benefited. Uh, you know, your uh, statement that the, uh, you know, it has to be driven by passions uh, of individuals uh, rather than being enforced and that's the most important message uh, today, that how passionate we are to achieve what we intend to achieve, uh, or we are doing our job because we have been asked to do something, and we are compelled to do, uh, you know, for the sake of, you know, a, a salary that we are getting. So this is uh, this is what actually is to be inculcated, not only, you know, at this stage of our, uh, you know. Uh, development, but I think at the early stage of our education, uh, you know, we need to really inculcate this at the school level and building that passion, uh, that inner urge to do, uh, you know, something new, undiscover, uh, sorry, discover the undiscovered and then unexplored. So exploring the unexplored should be, uh, you know, uh, the motto. And that inquisitiveness probably needs to be really planned uh, very early. And that's what I said in one of the meetings that unless our school education is strengthened, you know, uh, and later developments, we are not really able to mold so much, uh, you know, as much we can do at the early stages. But that point is so important and vital for India. 
you know, uh, so uh, we don't have many new discoveries uh, which can actually attract Nobel Prize. So, so this is uh, what is very, very important. We have to remember those who have contributed and today you have highlighted contributions of several, uh, whether it is uh, Copernicus or Galileo or Robert Hooke or so on and so forth and our own Dr. Swaminathan or Sena Rao or uh, Abdul Kalam and so on and so forth. So I believe, you know, remembering them and uh, celebrate science and celebrate contributions and in the process enthuse young minds and ignite those young minds, uh, you know, to pursue science with all passion. I think <clears throat> all passion, I think that is what is very, very important. And that's what you highlighted, that we need to really uh, celebrate and remember and the process, uh, you know, enthuse others uh, to, uh, uh, you know, be, uh, uh, you know, involved, uh, engrossed uh, in doing good science uh, and building uh, tomorrow's future of this country. Uh, of course, uh, you know, we have uh, tremendously contributed to uh, you know, in uh, you know, uh, in various forms in biological sciences and including agriculture, whether human health and particularly development of vaccines. You have elaborated, starting from BCG, smallpox to even COVID vaccine, and uh, the whole history you have placed before us is an exciting field. In fact, in case of animal science, animal system, we have similarly developed almost 30 vaccines in the country. And we are actually leaders in animal vaccine system. And uh, uh, starting from 1905, 1908, our vaccine development started. We have eliminated, uh, you know, three diseases uh, from this country by way of a very systematic vaccination. And our efforts are uh, on to eliminate very uh, serious, uh, you know, diseases like FMD and uh, brucellosis. PPR and so on and so forth. So the vaccination is going on in animal system. So, so this is uh, another area and a very challenging one given the evolution that takes place due to climate change, the way the RNA virus, the COVID virus is evolving and the way it is threatening and uh, newer strains are emerging so frequently. And that's, that's something which is really challenging. And we have to keep evolving uh, ourselves, our process, uh, so that we are able to meet these challenges. And you also talked about uh, the uh, happiness index and where we stand and how, uh, you know, GDP and uh, per capita uh, income and, uh, you know, all those, uh, you know, may not be sufficient alone, but it's a host of factors which contribute to this happiness index. India's, con uh, uh, you know, concept of happiness is a bit different from what uh, the way world measures happiness and uh, you know but our concept is forgotten and probably there's at this die time that we rediscover ourselves and uh, you know see how best we can uh, stay happy and then make others happy uh, even without uh, any materialistic possessions uh, uh, material possessions uh, so uh, certainly the social aspect is very very important you have rightly highlighted, and uh, you have taken us to the uh, you know uh, health at the global uh, you know uh, uh, scenario uh, with regard to health, energy, and agriculture, and uh, you know very very important. And rightly you have highlighted how uh, the other drugs, for instance, and uh, you know paracetamol, aspirin, you highlighted, but you also mentioned that the materials are still uh, being imported. And there are many instances where we have to depend upon others, microelectronics, the area, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, many, many others. So, you know, now we talk of com uh, quantum uh, computing and, uh, uh, you know, the kind of investment required, kind of uh, engagement required, kind of critical mass required in each one of those areas to discover and uh, uh, you know, develop technologies and that too, disruptive technologies, a lot more to be done. And we need to really learn from others, though many, many labs like yours, we have done uh, exemplary work uh, in these areas and uh, you know, contributed so tremendously, but uh, you know, a lot more uh, for us to do. 
uh, uh, and uh, uh, similarly in case of uh, agriculture and uh, how agriculture uh, has uh, enabled the sustenance of civilizations uh, you did mention about green revolution and briefly about white revolution although you didn't uh, really describe those and how science led uh, development has contributed to these revolutions but certainly challenges are many productivity is low and we our pesticides uh, you know pesticide and fertilizer uses are rather misuse of those in certain areas uh, leading to environmental issues and human issues health issues and uh, there are certainly concerns uh, but at the same time we have also uh, you know pathways you did mention about new technologies like gene editing and uh, you know uh, uh, certainly uh, you know uh, we would be moving faster given the notification uh, that uh, has come now uh, we need guidelines we need support we need again investment uh, you know uh, so uh, without the, those uh, you know the patent holders are somewhere else we have to deal with the uh, ip uh, encumbrances and then uh, move ahead uh, certainly you know there is plenty of opportunity uh, in the agriculture sector uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, redefine reposition uh, whether it is uh, integrated farming system scaling up as you rightly pointed out we have uh, more than 60 models in fact uh, you know more than 15000 farmers field they are now implemented in tamil nadu and kerala governments they have uh, they have come forward taken these models and implemented i believe the whole country needs to really look up to these uh, solutions uh, the organic uh, you know technologies again more than 50 such practices are there and uh, you know government is implementing through various schemes but it's a long way to go because the socio economy agro climate is so diverse in this country it takes a longer period for technology to actually penetrate and reach deep inside uh, the uh, rural settings in this country the complexities are huge but uh, certainly, the technology that you describe, like drones in agriculture, for various purposes, and today, large-scale use of uh, you know drones for spraying pesticides, uh, and in certain cases, uh, in, in many areas, uh, the use of nano uh, urea, uh, you know, uh, in the spray format using drones. It's very encouraging to see how farmers are coming forward to. Uh, uh, you know, embrace the new technologies and use them. And youngsters are coming forward uh, to provide services. And that's the very interesting and encouraging part. And uh, in fact, uh, IITians are coming back to agriculture to do precision agriculture. That's very, uh, you know, uh, encouraging. And uh, of course, uh, the production technologies and all those things, seeds have to come from agriculture research. But some of those uh, which are automation and sensor-based, you know, they can be managed and implemented very well. And particularly, you know, huge of uh, more of uh, uh, AI uh, uh, and then uh, blockchains and, and things of that sort, uh, you know, requires, uh, you know, that kind of minds. You did mention about the uh, uh, IICT work and the contributions with regard to the pheromones and also with regard to, you know, I had a uh, elaborate deliberation uh, with uh, your colleagues at the Indian Institute of Oilseed Research with regard to uh, modifications in the fatty acids, which uh, your institute is doing, and industry interface we had twice. And I'm sure uh, we would be able to discuss further and build this relationship. Particularly, we had interaction in the, you know, uh, with uh, DGCSIR, Dr. Sekhar Mande, uh, and, uh, you know, your uh, colleagues, uh, you know, in one of the programs uh, to use, uh, uh, you know, your pheromones uh, in, in cotton. Uh, and I believe uh, we should be able to really take it forward while still, you know, uh, looking at it. Trials are going on and we should be able to really take it forward. And we can have more discussion, of course. You did mention briefly about meat in the lab and I'm sure, uh, you know, again, uh, you know, DBT and ICR, they're working together. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully in some uh, recent, uh, you know, future, we should be able to deliver on this. Uh, you know, uh, the pros and cons need to be really looked at and uh, even a plant-based meat, uh, you know, the fish, uh, you know, same test 
to get from plant-based proteins. And that efforts are going on at the global level. And uh, we are yet to really start this in this particular area. And uh, 3D printing of food, I think that's another area using these, all these ingredients uh, to do that. So I believe we can uh, have plenty of opportunities to deliberate, discuss, and then implement some of these programs uh, in future. Uh, energy, energy is required. Agriculture, agriculture can contribute to the energy sector and uh, make agriculture carbon neutral. Uh, you cited the example of Wooten, and uh, certainly carbon neutrality is the essence, and that's our commitment. And uh, how best we can deliver on this, that's another area I need to really discuss. And the future is the future of machines, automations, and robotics. And in agriculture, also we need them. So, uh, you know, uh, DST and, uh, you know, DARE uh, can discuss in three, four of these areas that are how to discover new molecules to be used as a pesticide. So this country has not really discovered many new molecules to be used as a pesticide, for instance, and green molecules. And can you really discover them? Uh, pheromones, can we really implement them to control pests, uh, you know, uh, a large scale? Uh, and similarly, you know, once we are promoting organics and what way we can really do. And similarly, green energy in agriculture and green energy from agriculture. That's another area, you know, uh, we need to really discuss. And uh, how do we really go for large scale use of drones? And particularly requirement is, you know, of cheap sensors, low cost sensors. And we don't really get from outside and assemble these kind of uh, drones and then use them. So how do we get low cost sensors uh, to really build our programs in the country? Uh, so sky is the limit and certainly we must, last point that you mentioned is we must understand the trends and the processes and build our own thought process and our own science. And the originality has to rule. And I'm sure the ingenuity of human mind uh, is not confined by the boundaries of uh, I mean, geographic, geographical boundaries. And I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, India uh, uh, certainly would be limited, would not be limited by uh, its geog geographical boundary uh, to imagine new science. And uh, how do we really imagine new science uh, so that we become leaders uh, in many of these areas? So hopefully, uh, we will be having uh, uh, in the science group, technology group, we have technology focus. So how do we really bring this you know, uh, science component into it and uh, have greater investment in the science component of it? And that should be you know, uh, our focus. And I believe you being there and uh, a kind of dedicated scientist being there in that position, we should be able, able to deliver more. And, uh, and profuse thanks to you for very, very uh, you know, uh, informative, I would say, highly informative lecture full of information and also indicating what we should be really doing uh, in uh, you know, more uh, in relation to agriculture. So, uh, and energy and agriculture and automation, all this. So thank you very much on my side, Dr. Chandrasekhar for sparing your time for, uh, you know, we are every week arranging such lectures. It has been exciting 52 weeks by now. And uh, it's a challenge, but all of you are agreeing and coming forward and then, uh, you know, educating us. Our, we are enriched. So thank you very much once again, Dr. Chandrasekhar. Thank you. Thank you, sir, uh, for nicely uh, summarizing the talk as the chairman. And uh, thanks once again to uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar uh, for the wonderful talk. And uh, thanks to all our audience uh, for connecting uh, for this important lecture. So see you again, uh, all the audience, uh, our esteemed colleagues. And uh, thank you, sir, uh, to you also uh, for connecting and making it possible, despite your busy schedule, to attend this lecture. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Thanks, Professor yes, Arbi Singh, sir, for being there with us in every lecture. So thank you very much. Namaskar. Sir. Thank you. Namaste to all of you.